we go. All right, um, is this on? Yeah, all right, cool, thank you. Uh, so I'm Jacob Maskwitz, um, and I have a big long list of co-authors that I'm not gonna read out, um, but they're here, we, we work together on this. Um, and uh, so this is a systematic analysis of the Juniper Dooley C incident. Um, so to get started, um, around Dece December of last year, uh, 2015, uh, Juniper released an uh, out of cycle security bulletin detailing two uh, CVEs in their screen OS operating system for their net screen line of products. These are a line of uh, VPN firewall boxes that do a lot of different things. Um, but uh, the, the interesting thing about these two CVEs is that unlike most bugs that are caused by developer error, uh, Juniper had claimed that these were caused by some unknown attacker gaining access to their source modifying it such that their releases had these backdoors in them. So the, the first was an administrative access backdoor, um, and the second was a VPN decryption backdoor. And they didn't give a lot of details in the CVE. Um, so naturally, uh, the security research community, particularly on, tw particularly on Twitter, uh, started to look into this and discuss this and try and see if we could figure out exactly what was going on here. Um, so with the first uh, vulnerability, this was, uh, uh, SSH backdoor that works exactly how you expect with a hard-coded password. Um, it, interestingly, the hard-coded password was disguised as a format string, so if you just did strings in the binary, you might not catch it. Um, uh, but this one was not nearly as interesting as uh, the VPN decryption CVE. So um, H.D. Moore uh, started some of this work. He took the, uh, the last known safe version, according to the CVE, and the first known vulnerable version to this VPN decryption attack, um, and just did a diff. And we found uh, that the, the main thing that was different was this constant. It was just this long 32-byte hexadecimal constant. Um, and at first it wasn't clear what it did, but if we look at the constants nearby, uh, they're all things involving the P256 curve, constants used for this elliptic curve thing, and through some reverse engineering, um, we discovered that these, uh, this constant that was changed was being used as the X coordinate for the Q value in the dual EC random number generator. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, th both of these values, the, the safe value and unsafe value, according to Juniper, um, neither of them are the NIST standard value that you would use for Q if you're implementing dual EC as NIST suggested. Um, so a little bit about dual EC. So dual EC is a random number generator. It was one of the uh, random number generators that uh, was approved by NIST. Um, it was originally designed by the NSA and pushed for standardization uh, in NIST. I'm going to skip over some of these points um, to jump to. In 2007, uh, Shumo and Ferguson demonstrated a theoretical uh, backdoor attack in dual EC. So uh, they postulated if you have an attacker who knows the discrete log between the two points in the curve, P and Q, uh, that attacker can, given one output of the random number generator, recover the state of the generator, and therefore every number that it will ever generate in the future. Um, after some of the Snowden revelations in 2013, uh, our research group took a look uh, at Dooley, a closer look at Dooley C uh, in 2014 at Usenix. We demonstrated practical attacks on TLS uh, if you're using Dooley C to supply your random numbers for uh, TLS. Uh, and later that year, NIST removed Dooley C from their uh, list of approved PRNGs. Um, so let's break down a little bit about how Dooley C works. Uh, so you're going to start with some state, uh, like any random number generator, and we're going to try and turn that state into a, you know, infinite stream of random numbers. Uh, so we're gonna do that with some elliptic curve math. So here we're gonna take that state, uh, multiply it by our point Q, this is repeated point addition, take the X value, um, truncate it, and then that is going to be our output. Um, then to generate our next state, we're gonna do a very similar operation with our other curve point P to get our next state, to get our next value, and so on and so forth. Um, so given that, here's how the back door works. Uh, you assume an attacker who knows the log base Q of P, I'm gonna call this value D. Um, D has this property that uh, D times the point Q will equal the point P. And what an attacker can do is they can start from this value R1 and with some simple uh, elliptic curve math uh, using this property that P equals DQ, they can recover the next state of the generator uh, and reverse this. And therefore they're able to generate all future random numbers uh, by the generator. So let's say you want to mount this attack. How are you going to find uh, this log QP? Well, you could solve the discrete log problem. 
Um, but that's not going to get you very far. Uh, you could be the person in charge of picking the official curve parameters. Because uh, if you're doing that, you can select them in such a way that you pick points where you know the discrete log, you publish the points, P and Q, uh, and you don't publish the D value, and so you know it, uh, no one else does. It's worth pointing out that the, the constant uh, Q that was in the NIST standard was selected by the NSA. Um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, we don't know that the NSA did this for sure, right? They, uh, given just the value P and Q, and no other information, it's not possible to tell if they were generated in a safe, random way, or uh, in a method such as this, where the party who supplied these values knows the discrete log. Um, the other thing you can do if you want to be able to mount this attack is you don't have to use the supplied Q value. You can supply your own curve parameters to dual EC. So with that in mind, uh, let's look at how uh, Juniper used dual EC in their screen OS uh, operating system. So uh, if you actually look at the FIPS validation for screen OS, um, it's only validated for the ANSI X931 generator, not for dual EC. However, uh, after some of the renewed interest in dual EC in 2014, uh, Juniper released uh, a statement saying, um, although screen OS does use dual EC, it is not vulnerable to the kinds of attacks that we described. Uh, and they say this is true for two reasons. One, they say they're using uh, their own Q value. And secondly, uh, they're not using dual EC output directly, that they're using dual EC uh, to reseed and feed into the ANSI generator, uh, and then using those random numbers in their connections. Um, so with those two reasons, one, the reason saying they're using their own Q wouldn't defend against these attacks. It would simply uh, change who your attacker is, who, who could potentially know this, this D value. Um, but the second piece where they're saying they're using this cascade of dual EC cascading into ANSI, this seems safe. Uh, the known attacks against dual EC depend on seeing raw dual EC output, not a one-way function of that output. Um, so this leads to a couple questions. Uh, so why does, we saw that this diff, the main change from the safe to the vulnerable version was just a change in Q. Why does this one change result in passive VPN decryption as the CVE describes? Um, if Juniper is using ANSI X39 and Julie C as they describe cascading, why doesn't ANSI protect them from this kind of attack? Um, with that, we, we were also curious about the history of random number generation code in screen OS. When was dual EC introduced? Um, we'd love to know how Juniper's Q value was generated. Was it in a safe, random way, such that no one knows this discrete log value, or was it generated in such a way that Juniper does know this discrete log value? Um, and since we saw that all that was changed between the safe and vulnerable versions uh, is this value of Q, we wonder, is the version with Juniper's Q value also vulnerable to this attack? Um, and so we explored the answers to these questions with forensic reverse engineering. So here, this is a uh, decompiled output from the uh, PRNG generate routine uh, inside ScreenOS. Now, uh, the names were not present in the binary. Those were supplied by us based on their apparent function. Um, but what decompilation does preserve is the, the control flow and the function uh, the, of, the, of the code here. So um, at first glance, this RNG appears to work exactly as Juniper's described. We'll look here. Um, and we'll see that there's a, a conditional reseed. Under some condition, we're going to reseed the generator. Going into that reseeding function, we see that right here we're going to generate some dual EC output. We're going to put that somewhere in the, in the PRNG internals. And then returning from the reseed, we're going to go into this loop and generate output using this new key with the ANSI X931 generator. So looks fine. Looks like it's working as described. But it turns out there are a few subtle bugs uh, that make this code not work as expected. So first, I'm going to point out this PRNG output index variable is a global variable. Um, I want you to remember that. I'm going to come back to it. Uh, this condition for when we're going to reseed is actually always true. Uh, this means on every call to the generator, it's going to reseed and go call dual EC. It turns out there is a way to make this not always true, but it's via an undocumented command line option, uh, and it leads to other uh, issues. So going into the reseed, uh, we have another global variable here, the dual EC. Uh, it, its output is going to go into this global buffer, PRNG temporary. Um, remember that for just a minute. Uh, coming back to that first global variable, the index, right here inside the receipt function, that global variable gets set to 32. 
Presumably, this is indicating that uh, dual EC has returned 32 bytes of output. Um, however, if we come out uh, of the receipt function and look at the loop here uh, that's calling ANSI-X931, the loop condition is while that index is less than or equal to 31. 32 is never less than or equal to 31. What this means is that um, the ANSI-X931 generator is never run. We only run dual EC. And if we look at where uh, the code is expecting the output to be of, this, of its random numbers, it's that same global buffer that is now currently holding the dual EC output. So what this means is that this uh, RNG generate routine uh, returns raw dual EC output. The ANSI generator is never run. Um, even though this is bad, the presence of dual EC output doesn't imply full VPN decryption. Um, so let's take a look at how ScreenOS handles VPN. Um, so ScreenOS is going to use the Internet Key Exchange, or Ike, protocol to do VPN. Um, so a little bit about Ike, it's used to establish keys for a VPN session. Um, there are two major versions, Ike v1 and Ike v2. Um, both of them use uh, two phases. In the first phase, they're going to establish some keys. Uh, they're then going to use those keys to encrypt the second phase. And in the second phase, they're going to establish some keys uh, for IPsec or whatever other encapsulated protocol for the rest of the VPN connection. Um, both of these phases are going to present nonces and do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange to get their shared key material. Um, to look a little closer at the phase one handshake, so there's a series of payloads that'll be sent, and this is the order that they're sent in on the wire. Um, the two that I want to point out are the, first, the key exchange payload is going to have a Diffie-Hellman key exchange data. This is going to be uh, like a G to the X. Uh, it's the X in ScreenOS, that private exponent, is going to come directly from dual EC. Um, additionally, the nonce, Ike doesn't specify uh, the length of the nonce. It could be anywhere from 8 to 128 bytes. Uh, in ScreenOS, uh, it's a 32-byte nonce that, again, comes directly from dual EC. Um, so knowing that these values are supplied by dual EC, uh, this suggests uh, a multiple handshake key recovery attack. So what we have here is a series of dual EC states and the outputs that were generated. Um, we're going to assume we're doing uh, a, a series of Ike handshakes, and we're going to uh, apply the random numbers in the order of presentation. So our first random number is going to be our private exponent. Our second random number is going to be our nonce, and so on into our second connection. Uh, this is a bit oversimplified, but uh, this is just the concept. So what a dual EC attacker will be able to do uh, is take the nonce from that first connection, apply the backdoor function, because this attacker knows this discrete log value, d, um, and recover the state of the generator from the nonce that's sent in the clear. From there, they can see the future numbers that'll be generated, and the next number generated is the number that's used as the private exponent in the next connection. So what this means is that after observing one connection, the attacker can decrypt the next, hand, the next connection to the ScreenOS box. Um, however, uh, in our reverse engineering, we found this concept of nonce queues that ScreenOS uses. So, um, their ScreenOS has this background process that's filling these queues. There's a queue for nonces. There's a queue for each of the Diffie-Hellman groups, both mod P and elliptic curve. Um, and they're, they're, they're filled up ahead of time uh, in a background process. So it runs once every second, and it's pre-generating nonces and keys. Uh, it actually is this interesting behavior that the nonce queue is always filled before the key queues. What this means is that for any given uh, pair of nonce and key at the head of the queue, the nonce will have been generated before the key, despite the fact that the presentation order in, in Ike would, in, would make it look like you would have them generated in the other order if you're generating on demand. Uh, additionally, because we uh, replenish the queues, uh, always nonces before keys, after we pop off the head of the queue for our nonce and our key, we regenerate, refill the queue, we maintain this property that the nonce is generated before the key. So what can we do with this? Well, with, because of this behavior in these nonce queues, we can do a single handshake key recovery attack. So again, here we have dual EC states and their outputs. We're going to have a single handshake, and because the nonce is generated ahead of the key, uh, we get this behavior where, uh, despite the presentation order, our nonce is the first value we generated, and our key is a later value we generated. Here, I have it as the subsequent value. A dual EC attacker can take that nonce set in the clear, use the, the backdoor value D to uh, recover the state of the generator, 
and then immediately know the key, the private exponent, and therefore the key that's used in that connection. So a passive attacker can see one VPN connection and immediately begin decrypting traffic. There are a few caveats here. Um, there are some scenarios that can degrade a single handshake attack back down to a multiple handshake attack. Uh, so first, if you're making uh, very quick connections to the ScreenOS box, uh, you can exhaust the queues. So these queues are replenished at one non sort key per second. Uh, so if you have uh, more connections in a second than you have keys and nonces, they'll be uh, depleted. When the queue is empty, the values are generated on demand. So then we return to the behavior that our key is generated before our nonce. Um, additionally, uh, your phase two exchange in Ike doesn't necessarily have to be a Diffie-Hellman exchange. Uh, you can have some other types of exchanges, like based on the pre-shared key. Uh, and because of this, you, will, you still pop a nonce off the queue, but don't pop a key off the queue in this phase two connection, uh, which means you'll exhaust your nonce queue at a different rate uh, and, again, be degraded. And uh, there's a few more details in the paper. If you have multiple Diffie-Hellman queues, you enable multiple Diffie-Hellman groups, a similar situation can happen. But in all of these cases, uh, you are still able to mount the attack. You just may need to listen to a few connections before you're able to decrypt a connection. Um, so uh, to prove that this was not just theoretical and that we could do this, we bought a uh, NetScreen SSG 550M, which is one of the listed vulnerable devices. Um, we took a version of the firmware that was uh, uh, deemed by Juniper to be one of the safe versions. We replaced Juniper's Q value with our own Q value in the same way that the unknown attacker did. And we did it in such a way that we knew the discrete log for our Q value. Uh, we then generated a series of VPN connections, uh, recorded them, and then uh, tried our key recovery attack. Um, what we found was that it worked. Uh, the first thing was that it didn't work in Ike v1 with pre-shared key. Uh, the reason for this is that the, the, the keying material takes the pre-shared key as an input in Ike v1 uh, if you're using pre-shared key. So depending on the strength of this pre-shared key, uh, it, you have to have an offline attack against the key, and that will depend on whether or not you'd still be able to do the attack. Um, however, if you use uh, cert-based authentication, uh, there's the, all of the inputs to the key material we can, we can recover, so we can do full VPN decryption. And in Ike v2 with pre-shared key, the pre-shared key is no longer an input to the keying material, uh, so the attack works there. Um, Ike v2 with cert works very similarly to Ike v1 with a cert, and the attack uh, should be, work exactly the same there. Uh, so, to change gears, I'm um, now going to look at the, the version history of ScreenOS. So we'd like to know, like, when did Dually C get implemented in ScreenOS and, and see if we can uh, draw some conclusions from that. So, uh, what I'm going to look at here are two versions of ScreenOS that are uh, subsequent versions. So, 6.1.0 revision 7, which is the last 6.1 version, and 6.2.0 revision 0, which is the first 6.2 version. Um, both of these versions are before uh, the unknown attacker modified Juniper's source code. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a look. Uh, in in 6.1, it used just the ANSI X931 generator. 6.2 introduced this dually C cascading into ANSI concept. In 6.1, the generator was seeded by interrupts. Uh, in 6.2, uh, it introduced the bug, these global variable bugs, that caused uh, dual EC to be exposed upon reseed. Additionally, uh, in 6.1, uh, the generator was reseeded every 10,000 calls to the generator. Uh, in 6.2, it had this behavior where it reseeds on every call to the generator. Uh, in 6.1, there were no nonce queues. There were uh, Diffie-Hellman key queues. But nonces were always generated on demand, which had the behavior that uh, the key would always be generated ahead of the nonce. Um, and the last thing I want to point out is uh, this, this interesting change was the change in the, the length of the nonce in Ike. So remember, Ike specifies that your nonce is somewhere between 8 and 128 bytes. Um, once you're at a certain length, you're 20 bytes, 32 bytes. There doesn't seem like there's a big difference. Cryptographically, there's not really a, a reason to go between 20 and 32. Um, and so at first this, you're saying, well, this, this is fine. It's just a little bit more randomness in our nonce. What's wrong here? Well, uh, it turns out that a 32-byte a dually C output, seeing a full 32-byte output from dually C is actually going to facilitate the attack. 
So here we're going to take a look. Um, raw output from dual EC is 30 bytes long. So in order to have a 32-byte nonce, what ScreenOS does is it takes two outputs. It's going to give the full first output and then truncate the second output to two bytes and then concatenate those to form a single 32-byte output. Um, so uh, in a dual EC state recovery attack, uh, I, I sort of glossed over this before, but there's uh, a 2 to the 15 work involved. Uh, when you go to, when an attacker recovers the state from a single output, he actually gets 2 to the 15 possible states. Um, and you have to use subsequent outputs to narrow down those states. Uh, what we can do here, because we have these extra two bytes from the next dual EC output, for each of those possible states, we can generate the next value and then compare it against those two bytes. Uh, what this does is this narrows down all the possible states, um, and in practice we found this results in one to three possible states, usually one, sometimes two or three, that you can then further narrow down uh, when you check against the key afterwards. Um, additionally, if uh, ScreenOS had stuck with their 20-byte nonce length, this attack would be completely impractical. Those extra 10 bytes introduce way too much work for this attack to be practical. You'd have to guess those 10 bytes in addition to this 2 to the 15 work. Uh, and the attack becomes completely impractical. So again, in this single version, uh, single point release from 6.1 revision 7 to 6.2, uh, we introduced dual EC, the, the receding bug, we re the screen notes receded on every call, it introduced nonce queues so that nonces were generated ahead of keys, and it lengthened the nonce from 20 bytes to 32 bytes, which went from uh, even with all those other changes, if the nonce length stayed at 20 bytes, this attack would have been impractical or impossible to not only practical but convenient because you, you have two dual EC outputs. Going back to this diff, uh, we see that the attacker changed constant not till much later in 6.2.0 revision 15. So uh, all the attacker did was change constant. Um, although Juniper may, have not, may not have intended to introduce a backdoor, the changes that they made from 6.1 to 6.2 uh, at some of their design choices and their implementations resulted in something that looks and works just like a backdoor for an attacker that has this discrete log value. So we have this completely passive attack that was enabled in a single point release. Uh, Juniper's fix uh, when they announced this security bulletin and announced these CVEs was simply to revert to their original queue value. They left dual EC, they left the nonce queues, they left the reseeding bug. All they did was return to their original queue value. Uh, after some of our work was publicized, uh, we talked a little bit about it at Real World Crypto, um, uh, Juniper removed dual EC from their ScreenOS line of products um, completely in, in April. Um, so going back to our list of questions, we have some answers now. Um, a change in queue results in passive VPN decryption because uh, we're relying on dual EC output and it cascades all the way through. Uh, we're not protected by the ANSI generator because the ANSI generator is never actually run. Uh, we see that uh, all of the properties that make up this back door uh, were introduced well before the unknown attacker modified Juniper's source. Um, however, we don't know how Juniper's queue value was generated. As I said, just given this P and Q and no other information, there's no way to tell if Juniper's Q value was generated in a safe, random way or in such a way that Juniper holds this discrete log value and could launch this attack. So the answer to the question, is the version of ScreenOS with Juniper's Q vulnerable to attack? It depends how Juniper's Q value was generated. If it was generated in such a way that they didn't know this discrete log D, then the version with Juniper's Q is just as vulnerable to the attack. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. So questions? We have a little bit of time. So let me start then. So uh, you, so how, um, um, how much time did this uh, re-engineering uh, take? Because that seemed to be a lot of work. Uh, it took a lot of time. So uh, Steve Checkaway and myself mostly were doing a lot of work in IDA, spending a lot of hours looking at a lot of different versions. Uh, so this started shortly after the security advisory uh, in December, um, and we worked through uh, May-ish, not quite to May, April, uh, on and off. Yeah, pretty dense towards the beginning, and then uh, less and less as we we're trying to then mount the attack rather than just understand did, it. Did you use any tools? Any uh, IDA. Tool? Lots and lots of IDA. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Hi. 
Um, very, very nice investigation, nice talk, thanks. Thank you. Um, did you investigate a bit on the ANSI KDF that they're using? My understanding is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a standard model of how you do this, right? You have slow PRNG, and then you do some uh, KDF, you want to expand on the randomness. So in theory, that construction is legit, that's what you would use. Yeah. And even without the backdoor, they would actually have to fix that ANSI invocation to properly create the number of, of, of the amount of randomness that they need for creating the nonces and the Diffie-Hellman exponent, I guess. This just run, running it once is probably not sufficient because they're not looping, as you pointed out, the, the, the looping was broken. Right, because so well, I mean, the, the thing is that that loop never gets called, so the ANSI generator was not ever being run. Yeah, but, but you, you need that, right, to expand on the initial randomness. You, you want to actually produce, or, or was the initial randomness enough to produce the nonce and the Diffie-Hellman public key? Um, I'm not sure I follow the question. So the construction as it was described or as it appeared to work seems like it would be fine. Um, okay. But what, what, what turns out is that uh, they say that they're not exposing dual EC output and directly and they're using this KDF and they're not. What we're seeing is dual EC gets run and dual EC is, is what is, it goes out on the wire. Okay, so you're saying the ANSI one was a kind of legacy thing they kept in there because they switched from the one randomness source to the other one? Well, no, because if you look at their, uh, their claim in 2014, they said, they said that they were, only, they were using, previously they were using ANSI reseeded by interrupts, now they're using dual EC reseeding into ANSI. Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't claimed that it was legacy, that was, that was, they were claiming that was the core of their random number generator, um, when it turns out it was not. Mm. Okay, thanks. can talk later maybe. Hi, David Hartley from Qualcomm. That was a really great talk, really good one. Thank you. I was interested in the fact you said you were able to modify the Q value. Was that a runtime modification in memory or were you able to change that in firmware? Oh, uh, no, we just, we went into the firmware, we changed the value, uh, we updated a checksum and then flashed that onto the box. Uh, the ScreenOS box, you have the option to install a cert, uh, which will validate your, your firmware that it's signed by Juniper. You can also not install that cert, so we didn't. <laughs> um, there's lots of uh, other um, router uh, or router uh, vendors out there. Mm -hmm. Have you gone hunting for dual EC signatures in other uh, chunks of software? Uh, not yet, though we are planning to. Okay. Hi, uh, George Aririos, Columbia University. So, given that you have all this knowledge now on the internals, did you try to check what they did after removing dual EC? Like you said, they completely removed it in April. Like, yeah, so they are doing what exactly? Yeah, so their, their claim was they were going to replace it with the, uh, the same system that's in uh, Juno S. Um, and I believe that's a HMAC DRBG. Uh, and I, we, I believe we, we glanced, we looked through the new firmware in April, and it looked, like it, it looked like it was HMAC DRBG, though we didn't look very closely. Okay, thanks. Okay, so thank you very much again. Thank you.